Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 24, the title of this message is Sensitivity to the Spirit. Sensitivity to the Spirit. Now today, everyone is so sensitive to everyone's feelings. No one wants to boldly speak the truth anymore in fear of offending someone's sensitive feelings. However, it is totally okay to offend Christians and to say offensive things about Christianity. But what about us being sensitive to the Holy Spirit? John 16 and verse 13 says, the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. If that is the case, then we need to be sensitive to what the Spirit of God is saying because the Spirit will guide us into all truth. Uh, John 16 and verse 8 says, The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And we will see this in the life of David. Look what it says there in verses 1 to 3. It says, now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. And so he came to the uh, sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. And Saul went in to attend to his needs. And David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Now, in these verses, <clears throat> we see after Saul went back to fight with the Philistines that he heard had invaded the land of Israel in 1 Samuel 23 and verse 27, now King Saul came back to pursue David. He heard in verse 1 that he is now in the wilderness of En Gedi. Uh, this time he brought 3,000 chosen men in verse 2 to seek David in the rocks of the wild goats. He came to the cave in verse 3 where he had to, uh, as the scripture says, attend to his needs. In other words, he had to use the restroom. Uh, the law of Moses was very strict concerning uh, you know, just where you went to do number two. Uh, you had to have a shovel and you had to bury it, according to Deuteronomy 23 and verses 12 through 14. So he, Saul, saw this cave and went in to relieve himself. However, he didn't know that this was the cave David and his men were hiding. Let's see what happened next. Look at verses 4 through 7. Then the men of David said to him, this is the day of which the Lord has said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterwards that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Now, these verses are so critical and, and they give us, you know, uh, uh, insights into the heart of David. I believe that this was a test by God for David, as if God was saying, what would you do, David, if I delivered your enemy into your hands? Will you kill him or will you allow me to deal with him? Because we are humans, all of us will have enemies, people who are either at odds with us or we with them. I mean, Jesus had enemies. The real question is, how will you react when it looks like God delivered them into your hands? Will you seek revenge? Let's see how David dealt with his enemies. Now, 
notice how the men in verse 4 said to David, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. Now, when did God say this? Some scholars surmise that God said this through some select verses, but there is not one verse where God said these words. Because it is suggesting that David seek revenge, something God's word forbid us to do according to Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 19. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So why would God tell David to seek revenge when that was against his very nature for him to do? God never said these words. This is the thing. This is why I believe that this was a test. What did David do? Well, the robe Saul took off to relieve himself. David arose and secretly cut off a corner of it. We need to be very careful of the advice we are giving people, and watch this, and attaching God's name to it. The Lord never said this, and because it sounded very logical and sensible, David went and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. If it is of the Lord, then why did he have to do it secretly if, with, if it was the Lord? If your relationship is so of the Lord then why are you constantly trying to keep it a secret? Oh, and many of you try to justify yourself and say, well, you know, I just don't want people in my business. Oh, how about if it's so of the Lord, how about making it public so you can be an example of how to be in a relationship? Uh, and because you're keeping it a secret, oh, that should be the, that should be the telltale sign there. Luke 8 verse 17 says, For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. No matter how secret you try to make it, it's going to come to light. Somebody's going to know. Somebody's going to find out. And David would have not done this secretly if it was truly, truly of God. To show you that this was not of God, notice verse 5 said, David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. Look at how sensitive David's heart was to God and his spirit. So often God will test us with what we thought was a blessing, but when we take the bait, we will see that it was not a good idea. See, this is where we mess things up. We forget to realize that God's testings and Satan's temptations are two sides of the same coin. As God is trying to use a test to draw us to himself, Satan would take that test, turn it into a temptation in order to turn us away from God. And so often we misinterpret the testings of God as Satan's temptation and vice versa. And we got to understand, see, when David cut his robe, this was very significant. We just look at it in American mindset, American mentality. We look at it as, okay, you know, um, he just cut off a little piece of his robe. Oh, it was very, very, very significant. He was saying all of Saul's power, authority, and rights were given to him by cutting off this, the edge of his robe. See, it was something about the robe of someone in authority. Why do you think the woman said, if I can only touch the hem of his robe? It's something about the robe. It's something about it. That we in American mentality, American mindset, we, we don't understand that there's a significance. 
when, when Sam, the prophet Samuel was going away, King Saul turned and grabbed his robe and ripped it. And, and he said, so shall the kingdom be ripped from you. There's something significant about the robe that we don't understand. So as he cut off a piece of this robe, he was in essence saying, Saul's power, authority, and rights were given to him now. I'm cutting it off from you. And this is why, watch this, David's heart troubled him because he was in essence taking matters in his own hands. Oh yes, he was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel, but it will be fulfilled in God's timing, David, not your own. He was, in a sense, grabbing for Saul's position, something he should have never done. And this is why his heart troubled him. Precious people, wait on the Lord, like David will later write in Psalm 27, verse 14, wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. God will exalt you in due season, like Peter would later write in 1 Peter 5, 6. Waiting is one of our weakest areas we struggle with. I just know for me, I just, I hate to wait. I, I remember, <laughs> I remember when waiting just really hit, it just came to a climax for me. My children were younger and um, we drove down, which is another story of driving on family trips with kids. Um, this is another story. So we drove down to Disney World. So of course, you know, the kids were small enough where, but they were big enough, but they were small enough, but you had to ride the rides with the, with the kids. And I remember we were in the line for about 30 minutes and we got to a point that said, from this point, there is it's a 90 minute wait from this point. I said, kids, this is where I make my exit. I got out of that line, went and sat with my wife, and said, you own your own. I'm done waiting in these lines for a 30-second ride. I'm done. I'm done. And that's when I officially became old. <laughs> I became those, those old parents and grandparents that, you know, sit on the side while the kids get on the ride and they holding all the, the stuffed toys and all the stuff and, the, the stuff and they sitting there, you know, like a, a grandparent. Well, I'm that, I'm that. You know, we, as we, I had one day that I had to, I mean, one day, you know, we, we, we were in California and I was all over the place. And my little bitty wife was right next to me all over the place. And she said, can you do one thing for me? I said, honey, yes, I can do one thing. And she asked me to take her to SeaWorld. Okay, took her to SeaWorld. Veterans, we could get in free. Thank God for serving with Uncle Sam. Got online, ba -ba 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 boom, went down to SeaWorld. And it was a beautiful day of walking around and just eating. I am officially an old person. <laughs> Just, where are we going to eat next? <laughs> I, I sat and let her go watch the penguins and the dolphins and whatever else that I slit my wrist with. <laughs> but as long as I can go and get some more food, I was good. So I, I'm old. I'm, old. I'm officially there, and I'm, I'm okay, and I've accepted that. I got grandkids now, and I've accepted that. I'm good. I don't like to wait. And that's why some of my greatest trials is me waiting. And, and, and I just say, I just say, Lord, I see what you're doing. I don't like it, but I see what you're doing because that's an area I have to grow in. I'm very impatient. I told you the microwave was one of the greatest inventions of my time. You know, if I, back in the day, y'all my age, we wanted some popcorn. We had to get the jiffy, put it over the stove and or to put the, you know, the oil in there and the thing, you have to shake it, and the lid, you pick it up, point, pop it in the face, and, but now you just put a bag in, a couple minutes, it's done, you know, so it's one of the great inventions. I don't like to wait. I'm just letting you know waiting is tough for me. And so it is one of my weakest areas, and I know that many of you are just like me. 
it is a weak area for us. We struggle in. We get impatient. And watch this. We're tempted to get ahead of God. And watch this. And we secretly cut off the corner of someone's robe whose position we want. But the real question is, does our heart trouble us afterwards? If not, then that is a problem. If you are thinking that you deserve that position or my boss, my lead, that officer over me is a King Saul, I should be in that position. Be careful because if you can start cutting robes off to get ahead, you are not ready for that position. Your heart isn't right. Now, if you do cut off someone's robe and your heart troubles you like David did, then you have a sensitivity to God's spirit. That is a beautiful thing to have and something that you will never want to lose. I'm telling you, when you gain a sensitivity to the spirit of God, do all you can to keep it. Because you, watch this, when you lose it, it takes longer to get it back. Oh, I, can, I, can I talk to us for a minute? You remember when, you remember when Joseph and Mary, they went to Jerusalem to worship and Jesus was about 12 years old. So they're going back home. They would normally travel in that time as a family. Just think of you and your aunts and cousins and uncles and all y'all traveling as a, uh, uh, as we used to say in the Marine Corps, as a mob, just a big mob traveling. So, so, you know, kids can be playing with their cousins and just goofing off, but y'all all in this big caravan, you know, together. And you remember, it, it, they, they went a day's journey and I'm sure it was probably Mary. Joseph, where's Jesus? Oh, he's probably playing with his, his cousins and them back, back, back there. It's, you think we ought to check, Joseph? Oh, no, he's good. He, he's good. And so they probably went probably maybe one or two steps. And she said, you better go check on my boy. So they go, and he wasn't with the family. They panic. They panicked and went back to Jerusalem searching for Jesus. It took them three days to find him. He was in the temple. We know the story. But watch this. It took one day to lose him and three days to find him. See, when you have a sensitivity to the Spirit of God, don't lose it because it's going to take you longer to get it back. If that time that you took to develop a sensitive ear to the Spirit of God, to the voice of God through the Word of God. Don't lose it. Don't let something steal it because it's going to take you longer to get it back. We gain a sensitivity to God's Spirit by spending lots of time in His presence in prayer and His Word. When we do, we will know what his voice sounds like. We will see this in the life of Jesus. In, in Matthew 16, in verses 13 through 23, when Jesus asked his disciples, he says, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Peter, or Simon Bar-Jonah, Bar-son, son of Jonah, or John, Blessed are you, Peter, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. A little later on, Jesus told them how he had to go to the cross. And Peter jumps in again and said, far be it from you, Lord. You can't do this. And Jesus turned and rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You've heard me mention this many times, but watch this in this context. Jesus had such a sensitivity to God's spirit that he knew when they, his disciples, were speaking for God and when they were speaking for Satan. 
It, it seems so logical and, and right for David to take the advice of, of his men and kill Saul in the cave, but that wasn't the right thing to do. Now, someone may protest and say, well, why not? This man has been hurting me or, and hunting me like a dog. Here's my chance to get him back. And in this madness, see, here's the problem. We don't get to determine when our trial or testing is over. We don't get to determine when we get out of the fiery trial. That's not on us. We don't get to determine, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm done with this trial. We don't get to determine that. Not at all. That's, God, that's in God's hands. You heard me talk about the, those who work with the metals, the way that they will get the impurities off of these metals. They will send it through the fire. Uh, the smelters or those who work with these types of things, they will put the metal a into the fire and the gold into the fire to burn off the impurities. And you've heard me say this many times. And the way that they know that the impurities are all burned off is that when they can look inside of that pot and see their reflection, that's when they know that the gold is pure. It's been, all the impurities have been burnt off. And so too, God will turn up the fiery trials in our lives. And we're screaming, and we're like, oh, I'm hot. this is hot. I'm tired of being in this trial. But, but, but the trial isn't over until he can look into our lives and see his reflection reflecting back. That's when it's over. We don't determine when it's over. That's in God's hands. That's, that, as, as it's been said, that's God's business. And we need to leave it in his hands. David had this kind of heart. See, in verse 6, David uh, didn't have a heart of revenge, but a heart for God. He told these men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. He mentioned that twice. This teaches us a couple of things. Number one, that the Lord's anointed can behave very badly. All because you and I or someone is God's anointed, it doesn't mean that they can't behave badly. Saul is behaving very badly. He's being a terrible human being right now. But number two, it is not our job to try to take him out, uh, um, lift our hand against him, nor put our mouths on them in gossip and slander. God's leaders, you leave in his hands. He knows how to deal with us severely. Trust me. Oh, I've said this many times. I haven't said it recently. We all know um, Isaiah 54, verse 17. It, it, it says, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We, we've heard that, you know, we've heard that and quoted it many times ourselves. But watch this. When you begin to put your mouth on God's anointed, you have now become a weapon formed against them and you won't prosper. See, we fail to realize that. See, we just so loose with our lips and so loose on social media. We so loose, we just talk about people. And just know as you are talking about people, you're being formed as a weapon against them and you won't prosper because the Bible says no weapon formed against us shall prosper. I just say leave folks in God's hands. Yes, David was the Lord's anointed but King Saul, don't miss this, King Saul was the human instrument God was using to get David ready for the throne. He was not ready. Even though he was anointed as the next king of Israel, he wasn't ready for the throne. And God was using Saul as the human instrument to get him ready. David wasn't ready for the throne yet. He would have jacked the throne up if he got in before all of this process was done. So David restrained his servants with these words, and he did not allow them to rise against Saul. 
And this is how our attitude should be when people come to us with gossip and slander and mess against the person God placed over us. We should restrain them like David did here, but instead we're joining in the lynch mob against the leader and encouraging this mob to leave the church, leave the job, leave the neighborhood, and there's been a bunch of this stuff that is constantly happening because we have social media. We fail to realize is that leadership is defined in one word, influence. And all of us have influence. And that's, this is why I had to be extra careful because of the platform God has graciously given me. I had to be extra careful of what I put. So now you see me put stuff on social media. It's a quote aspersion or uh, A.W. Tozier or it's a verse or it's something like that. All the other political, racial stuff, I, I had to just kick that stuff to the curb because I understand the platform that God has given me and that my influence could influence a whole lot of people, a whole lot of people. So, and then there are people who, you know, who comment on my stuff all the time, and then there's people that just sit back and watch. I, I had a friend of mine, friend of mine, you know, um, a friend of mine from the Marine Corps, you guys saw me post about him. And it was, it was just amazing, you know, as we talked and stuff, and um, I said, bro, I said, bro, how long you been um, married? He said, we've been married 34 years. I said, man, really? I said, yeah, we just went over 36. He said, I know. <laughs> He's never commented on anything. But he sits back <laughs> and watching. You'd be surprised you sit back. And so when you get your loose lips and running off at the mouth and all this sort of, you don't know who you influence. Oh, girl, we agree. Yeah, uh-huh, me too. Hey, it happened to me too. And, you know, and you don't even realize you're gathering a lynch mob against whatever it is is your cause. I, social media can be a good thing. It can be a great platform for you know, getting the gospel out, sharing, you know, some good quotes of some old school guys who, in yesteryear who said some great things. And, and, and you can influence, because there's things I've posted, people are like, oh, I needed to hear that today. But then we can get up there and run our lips and just, and just look foolish. And it, back when, social, when I first got on social media back about 12 years ago, I used, to, I used to write people and say, why are you putting this on here? You know, what, what's, why are you doing this? Stop fighting on social media. And I was like, the police. And, I was like, and then I, I finally had to say, I said, self? You know, David had to talk to himself sometime. He wasn't crazy. He had to talk to himself. He's, you know, he talked to him and said, why not, you know, cast down on my soul? He said, soul, what's wrong with you? Hope in God, get it together. So I had to say, self, I said, self, why are you doing this? I said, because they, it, and God said, don't, no, no. I don't want you doing that, folks. Run their lips and let them learn the lessons of running their lips and the consequences. I'm going to teach them. I can take care of it. I don't need your help. I said, All right. All right, God, you got it. Let you do your thing. And, and this is the thing we have to understand. Don't be the agitator or the gatherer of a lynch mob against someone. Don't, don't be involved in that mess. That's mess. That's petty high school mess. Don't, 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 don't do that. God's anointed, whoever it is that God has placed over us, is God's anointed to be over us. And God is using, they can be a King Saul, they can be a King David. God has them over us for a reason, because there's something he is trying to teach us, and he will use that person to do it. And I've seen where folks have gathered in, in, in groups and left a church, and they became a weapon formed against the pastor. I, I just, just some ugly, ugly stuff. 
This is why I don't have a problem. I've told people, I've heard things and see folks try to come through these doors, and I said, nope, don't come here with that mess. I've told people, go back, get it right with that pastor. Don't bring that here. Well, well pastor, don't, don't you want people to come to the church? Not those people. Nope. I tell them, hit the door. I don't bring that mess here. Don't bring it here. I, I, I know people, all, when folks leave other churches for every reason, they're like, come on, you can come here. You can come. Not me. Got enough drama with the folks already here. Don't need that drama. <laughs> Keep it moving or go back and get it right. I, don't, I, I just don't play those games. Now, in verses 8 through 15, we see David let Saul know what happened uh, in the cave and how he had a chance to kill him. He said in verse 9, why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed, David seeks your harm? The person who you consider your enemy, evaluate why they are your enemy. Are you listening to the words of people who are lying, saying this person seeks your harm? It, it reminds me of for those who are a little bit older, of, of Magic Johnson and Larry Bird back in the 80s. The media hyped up their rivalry from college. 79, they played in the NCAA uh, championship, and, they, and the media hyped up their rivalry from college to the pros to the point where they hated each other, and they didn't even know why. Until one day, they met off the court. And they laughed and joked and had a great time together. They ended up being good friends. Their hatred was based upon lies from the media. Today, it's the same, same way. People hate other people for no real reason. It's been hyped up by social media and other outlets and news outlets and depend upon your your slant that's the news you watch and you're all hyped up against this person these people and that sort of thing there were people telling Saul that David wanted to do him harm which David proved wasn't true by having a handful of Saul's robe in his hand he told Saul in verse 10 I could have killed you bro but my eyes spared you. And, and this is how you know that your heart is clear, your conscience is clear, is when you could do harm to your enemy, but your eyes spared them. When we're filled with anger and resentment, we will listen to those who tell us to kill them, do them in, but when our hearts are clear, our eye will spare them like David did. David goes on to say in verse 13 that wickedness proceeds from wickedness. Now, this proverb, it cut like a two-edged sword. It, it pointed out David's righteousness, but at the same time pointed out the wickedness of King Saul. Then David said in verse 15, let the Lord be judge and judge between us and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of your hand. David was allowing the Lord to fight his battles. He said, the Lord sees and may he plead my cause. This is hard for us to do. Allow the Lord to fight our battles. It's because we are an angry people and we want revenge on those who dare come against us. However, David rested in God's power to fight his battles, something that we all need to learn. Look at verses 16 to 22. It says, so it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, that Saul said, is this your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. I don't know why he's doing that. Just weeping like a baby or something, you know. But he knew he was weeping because he knew he wasn't right. His heart wasn't right. Then he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me, for when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? 
He said, therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now I know indeed that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Therefore, swear now to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me, and that uh, you will not destroy um, my name fr uh, from my father's house. So David swore to him, swore to Saul, and Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold because he knew that Saul was just talking and he was going to be after him again. Now, so when David finished saying what he did to King Saul, verse 16 said that Saul said, is that you, my son David? And he lifted up his voice and wept. He said, you're more righteous than I am in verse 17. He said, if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go safely? Showing that Saul wasn't David's enemy, David was Saul's enemy, but not the other way around. Then he acknowledged in verse 20 that David would be king over Israel. Then he made David swear not to cut off his descendants. And as my wife will so promptly say, look at Saul making this all about him. I mean, after all this, yeah, he could have said, you know, hey, okay, man, I'm sorry, man. Won't you come on back? You know, let's get this right. You know, let's come on back. I'm not going to kill you. Come on, you know. No, Saul said, you know, uh, can you not cut off my descendants? He, he turned it and made it about himself. So David swore to Saul in verse 22 that he would not cut off his descendants. We so often pray, Lord, change me. Make me more like you. I don't know about you. I, I find myself praying that I want to be more like Jesus, you know. I want to be more like the Lord. We think that it will be through some anointed teacher on YouTube or social media or some anointed author through a book or an anointed friend giving us some counsel. But watch this. So often God will send us a saw throwing spears at us. Hunting, hunting us like a dog for no reason. Let me ask you, let me ask you this. Who is bringing you grief and throwing spears at you, either on the job or on social media? Whoever just came to your mind is the anointed instrument for God to work, love, patience, kindness, tenderness that we so long for in our lives. We think that God is going to make us more like him through some, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when I'm really need a, a real punch, I, I go to YouTube and I listen to this pastor, I listen to him teach or preach and you know, I got, I got a good, he's my go-to person. Or when I need some counsel and wisdom, let me, this guy is anointing when it comes to marriage and relationship. Let me reread re his book. And we so often think that God is going to work the fruit of the Spirit in our lives through that, through those means. And so often it's through a saw. So often he will work, see, when I tell people, people say, you know, uh, Pastor Tony, I, you know, I'm like you. I, you know, I struggle with patience, so I just pray all the time, Lord, just make me more patient. And I always smile at them, and I always say what we used to say in the Marine Corps, stand by for the standby. Because the way that God works patience in us, he will bring so many chaotic things in our lives for us to exercise patience. That's how the patience is worked, through chaotic circumstances, through us having to wait. Well, everybody got their check. Why well, haven't got mine yet? Oh, you've been praying for patience, haven't you? It's through those circumstances. Oh, I, I just want to love people unconditionally. Okay, then God will bring some Judas or some person to betray you that you have to love that person and love them unconditionally, meaning that loving them with no strings attached. That means loving them when they don't love you back. And see, and, and, and that's the thing, you know, that we 
have to understand this is how God works these things in our lives, so often using uh, uh, Saul. David wasn't ready. He was anointed for to be the next king, but he wasn't ready to take that throne. And God used Saul. So to it, that person that came to mind, <laughs> who may be sitting right next to you, <laughs> That's the person God so often uses to work his fruit in all of our lives. It's not through the anointed book or speaker. Sure, God can use that. He's God. He can do whatever he want to. But so often it is through someone like a Saul. Because there is no other way for God to change us sometimes but to bring us a Saul. So the real question is, will you cut off the corner of his or her robe? Only we can answer this question. Or like I said, God will bring us a Judas, someone to betray us. I mean... <laughs> There's some things God had to work in David's life. We just hear, oh, David is the only one in the Bible who is said to be a man after God's own heart. Let me tell you something. He got that way through some tough times. His trusted friend, counselor, Ahithophel, just, just betrayed him. Absalom and his son coming to take the throne, and Ahithophel sided with Absalom. And many people are like, Dude, what? Dude, here's the fair. What's up with that? That was your boy. David was your boy. He, David said in the song, we took sweet counsel together. We will see God together. And all of a sudden, you betrayed me? Oh, but people don't know that Ahithophel had a granddaughter named Bathsheba. And when David did what he did with Bathsheba, ah, oh, Grandpa, Pop-Pop was good with David then. He said, I'm good with you, David. I'm going, I'm going to turn on you. You don't do that to my grandbaby. I don't blame him. I, I did it. I, I'm a grand, I'm a pop-pop now. And so I, I understand that his fail. But so often God uses things like that. And the thing is, the instrument God uses, our temptation is to not be tempted to cut off a corner of his and her his or her robe, and allow God to deal with these people. He's allowed them to be the instruments who allow God to deal with them. But so often we're like, okay, you did that to me. I ain't going to forget it because I know you're going to need me before I need you. Oh, many people say that all the time. But when you do, you're, you're not ready. Your heart's not right. And God will make sure he gets you right. He will. He knows how to lovingly deal with his children. He does. Let me conclude with this. Sensitivity to the spirit. <clears throat> we saw how David was sensitive to God working in his life when he cut off a piece of Saul's robe and his heart was troubled. The old King James said his heart smote his, was smoted. So if you can cut off robes, slander people on social media, and give people a piece of your mind and you don't feel bad about it, that should trouble you. Because either you aren't a Christian or your conscience is seared in that area and you no longer sense a conviction of God's voice speaking to you in this area anymore. Either way, you need to repent and ask for forgiveness because that is not a good place to be. Remember, if I said, if you have a sensitivity to the Spirit of God, to His voice speaking to you, you, when you hear somebody speaking, you know they're speaking from God's heart. You know they're speaking from God's Word. Do all you can to guard that. Because if you lose it, it's going to take a long time to get it back. Finally, we gain a sensitivity to God's Spirit by spending a quality amount of time with him through prayer and his word. This way, we develop a sensitive ear to his voice and to his word. So make a conscious effort 
to spend more and more time with God this week and retrain your ear to hear God's voice instead of the voices of this world. God wants you to hear his voice. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. Do you know the voice of God? When people are talking to you, when people are sharing their advice and their wisdom, do you know whether it is God's voice or whether it is just the voice of this world? David was sensitive to God because when they said the Lord, you know how people love to throw the Lord. The Lord said, today I'm going to deliver your enemy into your hands. And here it is. Remember the Lord said that. And here it is right here. God, you go take him. Take him out. And he said, let me just cut a little piece of his robe. And his, his heart, his heart troubled him. When you're gossiping about someone, when you're talking about someone, when you're making fun of someone, does your heart smoke you? Does it trouble you? Or can you just do it and it's just willy-nilly, you just feel fine? Hmm. I question that. I wonder about that. And leave God's anointed alone. Get your mouth off of them because you are being a weapon formed against them. And all of a sudden, whatever you try to do, it won't prosper. Leave God's people in his hands. Leave God's people alone. I'm just trying to give you a warning, a loving warning. Leave God's people alone. He can deal with God, his own people. Now, if somebody is in sin or whatever, we can lovingly go. And, no, but I'm talking about leave God's people alone as far as you putting your mouth on them in a negative way. You better leave God's people alone. Or you will find yourself not prospering in this life. Uh, I don't know who it is God is speaking to. I don't, I don't know. We just so loose with our lips. <laughs> we used to say loose, loose lips sink ships. You know, it, it, it does. It'll sink the ship of your life. And you'll find yourself not prospering. Yes, you've been hurt. I know. I know. You put them in God's hands. Let God deal with your wounded heart. And you put them in God's hands and take your mouth off of them. You won't prosper. If you, if you don't heed what I'm saying, you will not prosper. Somebody need to hear that today. Somebody online, somebody need to hear that today. Need to hear that today because we're so loose with our little lips. And we just say whatever we want to say and we think it's okay. You know, we can say what you want to say, but the question is, does your heart smoke you? Or does your heart trouble you afterwards? No. I'm ready for the next round. Man, you got to repent because we want to have a sensitivity to God's voice, a sensitivity to God's spirit. And we don't want to try to justify ourselves. David allowed the Lord to fight his battles. And David was a warrior. He said, but this stuff, I'm letting the Lord do it. And we got to learn to do that. I, I like, just like you, I like, to, I like to fight just like the next person. And I can do a good job fighting with my mouth. I'm gifted with my mouth, with words. Um, and I can give people the up one side, down the other. In Jesus' name. <laughs> and God, God's been dealing with me about that. Because God wants us to, to, to be, be sensitive. And... It's just, like the, it's just like the comb that we used to have. You remember the white tooth back here? And God wants to take those big things out of our lives. And then you remember that little part with those little bitty teeth you used to you get, get back? Oh, okay. okay. Mom used to get that green grease. That, you know, oh, okay. Okay. And, and there are some fine tooth things that God wants to start doing. Um, and, and, and we need a sensitivity to his spirit in order for him to do that. 
in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for sharing these things with us. Lord, forgive us for our big mouths. Forgive us for saying things that we shouldn't be saying about your anointed. Forgive us, Lord, for being a weapon formed against people. And Lord, you told us that we shall not prosper. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to have a sensitivity to your voice, a sensitivity to your word. Help us, Lord, to spend more time with you as you are calling us away. Help us to be sensitive to your voice. You calling us away to pray, calling us away to seek your face. And, and Lord, I just pray if there's anyone here who has not repented of their sin and accepted you as their Lord and Savior. If you're here today, if you're here online, just repeat this prayer after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I believe you died on the cross and was buried and rose again. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Help me to live for you from this moment forward by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. If you uh, prayed that prayer, there's a QR code on the screen. If you prayed that prayer online, there's a link for you to click on and uh, let us know that you prayed that prayer or if you have any other prayer requests. And once again, like we say on Sunday mornings, if this message is a blessing to you, share it on social media because you know here at Calvary Chapel, we're committed to making God's word plain one verse at a time. God bless you.